Hey, what's up guys? Today, I'll show you a science fiction horror film, Possessor. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with a woman standing in front of the mirror. She cautiously inserts a metal gadget onto her scalp. As blood oozes out of the puncture wound, she turns on the device and smiles at her own reflection. She begins sobbing as she calibrates the level of the mechanical device that is connected to her brain. Several seconds later, she stops the device, wipes her tears, and leaves the bathroom. Not long after, the woman, now wearing a blue jumpsuit, enters a hotel lobby. She is called by a blonde girl, who is her co-worker and has been waiting for her for a while. While in the elevator, the blonde woman goes over the plan, making sure it all goes smoothly. The woman, together with her co-workers, enters a formal party. And the woman grabs a knife and casually walks up to a white man in a suit. She stabs the innocent man on the neck with no hesitation. The people scream and start to leave in terror, as this woman of color continues to stab the man multiple times. She then grabs the gun in her purse, asks to be called back, and proceeds to kill herself. But she hesitates, she couldn't pull the trigger even though she had to do it. A group of policemen enter the crime scene, and they start shooting at the woman. A male cop walks up to the lifeless body of the woman, and fires one last shot on her head, ending her life right there and then. The assassin wakes up in her own body, gasping, completely nauseated, and vomits from using the brain implant technology that she is just in. In order to check if the assassin is really back in her body as herself, the handler assesses her memories with a series of tests. In front of the assassin is a box filled with personal belongings. These are her personal objects. One by one, she sorts through each of them. She reminisces about each of the objects from her personal belongings. Once she reaches a specific object, she ends up telling her handler about her guilt. When she was young, she caught a butterfly and wanted to keep it as a memoir by trapping it inside a glass case. Now that she is older, she still feels guilty about catching that butterfly. Throughout the entire session, the assassin is meant to reconnect herself with her real identity. The handler expresses her excitement for a new assignment, and wants to make sure the assassin is on her best self, also reminding the assassin of her current situation regarding her relationship status. The handler does not approve of the assassin's connection with her family, specifically her husband and her son, because she believes that this assassin is better at doing her job without any personal attachments. During the debriefing session, the handler informs the assassin that she is no longer with her partner, reassuring her that this assassin would only bring danger to her loved ones if she keeps up with the relationship. The assassin struggles with increasing detachment from her own identity. With that being said, she is incapable of fully separating herself from her occupation and her constant interaction with her loved ones. She goes back home to her family. As she stands in front of the house, she practices her lines, the way she normally speaks. She takes a hit off her electric cigarette. These are already some sort of mannerisms of hers all throughout her career of being an assassin. She spends time with her family by having dinner with her husband and their son. Due to the amount of time she spends taking over other people's bodies, the assassin gradually suffers from detachment issues from her own identity. Despite the thoughts of violence that continue to haunt her during her normal life, she agrees to her next assignment to murder a wealthy CEO and his heiress by taking mind control of the heiress's fiancé. As the assassin prepares to take over the body of the heiress' fiancé, she goes through a list of information to make sure that she knows exactly who she is controlling. The CEO and the heiress are apparently being targeted by the CEO's stepson because he wants to take over the company. And once it happens, the assassin's corporation will be able to take full control of the stepson and his company. The organization uses the special machine and inserts the assassin's consciousness onto the mind of her now victim, the heiress' fiancé. After the transfer, the assassin now wakes up in the body of the heiress' fiancé. At some moments, he experiences flashes of memories of the assassin's life while she is currently inside his consciousness. He tries his best to brush them off and continues to act normal as if nothing unusual is happening. Later, at a fancy party for the CEO organization, he presents a speech to his employees. The handler and the assassin, still inside the consciousness of the heiress fiancé, conjure a plan to make a scene that gets the fiancé kicked out from the gathering. Then he goes up to the CEO and gets into a fight with him, drawing attention to all the guests at the gathering. This scene surprises the heiress as her fiancé is forced out of the mansion. This unbelievable action done by her fiancé surprises her very much, that it breaks her heart to see a completely different person being dragged away from her. The party ends with the CEO and his heiress drinking their hearts out. Chugging her last glass of hard liquor, she excuses herself and leaves. The heiress' fiancé enters the mansion once more, grabs a fire iron, and makes his way to the dining hall, where the drunk CEO is sitting comfortably. 
As the CEO leaves for bed, he is not even remotely afraid of his future son-in-law's tactics. The fiancé stabs the CEO on the neck and continuously hits the body with the iron tool. Blood gushes from every part of the victim, and the fiancé proceeds to finish the job by impaling the fire iron in the CEO mouth. The heiress enters the kitchen and finds her father is being covered in blood and dying on the floor. Her fiancé grabs the gun and aims at her as she flees the scene. The fiancé lunges the fire iron in the CEO eye socket for good measure. Meanwhile, the heiress is shot three times on her back and struggles to leave. But her fiancé is able to catch up to her without breaking a sweat and takes care of her permanently. After all this, the assassin in the fiancé's body attempts to leave the crime scene by forcing the possessed body to shoot himself, so as to cover their murder of CEOs. However, she finds out she cannot make him pull the trigger to end everything. The fiancé, who is somehow gaining awareness of what seems to be happening in his surroundings, stabs his own skull instead, which damages the device that is currently implanted on his brain. The assassin discovers that she can no longer leave the man's body or even overpower his will due to that. He now regains control over his own thoughts and body. But now he doesn't quite understand the reason why he just murdered his future wife and future father-in-law. The fiancé is now confused. He doesn't know why he starts experiencing the flashes again, at this time, unknowingly seeing the life of the assassin in his own consciousness. The assassin, still inside the mind of the heiress fiancé, leaves the crime scene. He flees to the apartment of his brunette friend, being disoriented and traumatized. He asks her if he could stay in her place for a little while, hiding himself from the crime he just committed to the CEO and the heiress. As the brunette friend is taking a warm shower before she leaves for Chicago, the heiress fiancé struggles with dissociative memories. Recollection of the many murders of the assassin flashes before his very eyes. He wrestles with his own mind and tries to understand if the thoughts he sees are his or someone else's. Later on, a male colleague of the assassin arrives at the apartment to help her regain control of the body of the heiress fiancé and to complete the mission. This male colleague seems to be a huge fan of hers and knows about her famous hits, so it is definitely an honor for him to work with one of the assassins in her corporation. While the assassin is still inside the consciousness of the heiress fiancé, he experiences dissociation as if he is inside the assassin's body, living her domestic life. Unfortunately for the male colleague, the attempt fails, and the heiress fiancé wakes up to find the lifeless body of his co-worker on the ground. He slowly walks up to the bathroom and finds another body in the shower, with the corpse of his brunette friend. He realizes that he murdered her not too long ago. He gets a quick flashback of the murder. He stands by the shower door and shoots the brunette friend on the head, adding another person to the list of murder victims the assassin has. Immediately after the fiancé realizes that he just eliminated two more people, the fiancé grabs the gun and tries to kill himself. The assassin inside his consciousness forces his body to pull the trigger and to shoot himself on the head. But he fights back and aims at the mirror instead. He now becomes aware of her presence inside his body. His consciousness overpowers hers in a psychological confrontation, giving him access to the memories of her husband, her child, and their home. Subsequently, the fiancé finds himself walking along the road on the way to the assassin's family home. He practices his lines the way the assassin does it. He takes a puff of smoke from his electric cigarette. As he continues to perform these habits the assassin practices, he spots her son walking not too far from the house. He manages to speak with the son, not even over a minute before the assassin's husband calls the son home. The night falls, and the streets along the assassin's home are brightly lit. The heiress fiancé is standing a few doors down from the location he has been pursuing. He takes a couple more hits on his electric cigarette as he watches the house from meters away. Not long after he knocks on the front door, he tries to introduce himself to the assassin's husband as a friend of hers. The husband appears to not believe a single word the fiancé says, and politely asks this stranger to leave the premises. The fiancé stops the husband from closing the door and attacks him. He points a gun to the head of the assassin's husband and starts threatening her to show up. Finally realizing that the assassin can be free from her personal attachments, she goads the fiancé to kill her husband. As the fiancé is distracted by his own thoughts, the husband slaps the gun off of the fiancé's possession and pushes him to the counter. The husband falls to the floor and grabs the gun and shoots right at the fiancé, but unfortunately, he misses the chance to kill his attacker. The fiancé takes the meat cleaver from the counter and cuts a piece of the husband's hand off clean. The assassin's husband cries in so much agony as his killer stabs him continuously. Blood splatters all around the fiancé as he proceeds to completely end the life of the husband. 
Not long after, he leans on the kitchen counter, asking to be pulled out as he puts the gun in his mouth once more, still trying to kill himself. All of a sudden, the assassin's son forcefully pierces him on the throat. Red liquid splatters on the floor as he shoots at the direction where the son is standing. The assassin, now in full control over the body of the fiancé, continues to fire at the son, killing him. On the fiancé's final breath, he collapses on the floor right next to the son, drenches in a pool of blood. The assassin returns to her own body and discovers her handler had taken control over the body of the innocent son. The reason behind this act is for the handler to put an end to the struggle between the fiancé and the assassin. The movie ends with another debriefing session between the assassin and the handler. The assassin sorts through the same personal objects from the prior session they had. She admits to herself that she has no guilt in ending the life of the butterfly perfectly placed inside its case. With her husband and her son finally gone, she is now free of all human attachments, just like what the handler wanted in the beginning. At long last, she can now go on with her dangerous occupation that is meant for her. She can go on with her life as an assassin. With the amazing ability to take control over others' bodies for her assassination missions, she is the possessor. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.